you can't be a real sincere, authentic practitioner in your own tradition if you're not somewhat in touch with the wisdom of other traditions. Like at this day and age, that's just not, that doesn't work anymore. And the way I talk about it, and Adam Bucko actually shared this teaching with me from Father Bede Griffiths, which also resonates with me and I've heard in, in many other places, but this sense of the palm of the hand is where uh, all the wisdoms of all the ages and all the cultures and countries and places, that's one. And the fingers are the different pathways to that uh, common mystery and understanding and ability to actually live well in this world, in these bodies. We can do that. And these different paths try to take us there, but they're all going to the same place. So there's not like a different endpoint. And they're all coming from the same place. They're just expressing themselves in different ways. There is real relevance to these different paths. And I also see that we are at a time in, in our history collectively where we can't be over here. <laughs> you know, we have to be making the journey to the, to the common places because that's also what's gotten us into trouble is this, I have the path, I have the way, my tradition, my whatever is, but there's this need, there's this real need to synthesize, bring together, not try to merge, but there is a need to be much more aware. In the Buddhist way of seeing, everyone has Buddha nature. Everyone has this capacity to be much more than we think we are. And other traditions speak about the same thing different language. Adam has really been drawn into the mystical traditions of Christianity, which sounds so much and feels so much like what I've been exposed to in Buddhism and also in other Eastern practices of Hinduism or Taoism. There's this ability to just cut through the surface layers and the, the veils that keep us from seeing things as they are and this immediacy of connecting with life. Like this, some of the things I've read, there's this koan-like expressiveness from different mystics. One thing is I'm just so in awe of the huge, vast territory of Christianity that I didn't really know about growing up Christian. Like, I didn't study it very formally, uh, even though I practiced it. And there's so much of the Bible I never read, and we, we do Lexio Divina together often in the mornings. And so there's pieces of the Bible I'm like, Jesus said that? <laughs> and it's so radical, it's so profound, it's, I get chills. So one part is just like I'm covering more ground in Christianity than I ever did. <laughs> I remember picking up the Bible and reading as like a teenager. There was a lot that I didn't read and a lot that I didn't understand. So we'll take a piece of one little reading and we'll talk about it in the light of what's going on in our lives. And it's extremely applicable. There's always something in there that we can really look at how it addresses our life, how we wanna move towards something bigger or, or more in line with how we wanna live. So it motivates it, it inspires. And then with the mystical tradition specifically, one of the things he shared with me about is the dark night of the soul, which I've encountered wonderful teachings about in Buddhism in terms of inherent kernel of everything else. It is like you need to be aware of suffering and know how to care for suffering. And that is a part of life like that. That is the path is like suffering is there. And then how do you, how do you learn from that so that you don't recreate it unnecessarily and how do you live with it as gracefully as you can when you can't avoid it. But this understanding in the dark night of the soul that there are these moments in our lives that really serve to to temper us, to strengthen us if we know how to move through them, if we know how to honor what they're here to teach us, not like trying to take on more suffering. Than, <laughs> but when it's there and you can't avoid it, then how do you really live into that? This image of the burning log, 
that the things in you that need to get transformed and consumed by this fire, they get consumed and the fire becomes this real beautiful manifestation. It's not life attacking you. There really is this opportunity for transformation that you can choose to be a part of and move with. And then you really become an offering. Your life becomes an offering if you choose to accept that. I, I'm not explaining it as beautifully as, as, it, as it's explained in the teachings, but that image really, it resonates so much with some of the deepest teachings I've experienced and, and tried to practice in Buddhism in terms of if you can be able to look suffering in the eye, you're good. You don't have a whole lot to worry about. <laughs> That's why we all suffer because we can't do that. We can't accept what is there. But if we can do that, just look it in the eye, okay, I have tools, I have ways. And it's not that we're always going to be prepared or know what to do, but this general attitude of the mind that this is part of life and I am going to move with this. It's different. And then, okay, how do we move with that? How do I be present to really see all the different things that are going on in that moment? Those are some of the places where I've gotten really so much respect for the kind of hidden teachings of Christianity that aren't necessarily in the mainstream. It's just, to me, quite phenomenal that the language is so similar and the insights are so similar and I resonate with them. We read together, he and I, people who have done a lot of work in both kind of landscapes. So a Dominican friar who came and studied with Thay Thich Nhat Hanh and wrote a book about Meister Eckhart and Thich Nhat Hanh being his two main teachers or a couple where man is a Buddhist Roshi, the woman's a Catholic, you know, and they were writing about the rosary and their common practice of the rosary as a Buddhist Christian couple. As we delve into these other folks that are doing this amazing work of being in dialogue, there's just so much. And it's also like one tradition kind of needs the other to bring out certain things. It's like only from this perspective are you able to nourish that thing. But if you're in it, if you're in that framework, you won't see that special seed that needs to be watered. But if you're not in that framework, you can help, the other tradition can help aspects to grow and to express themselves more beautifully, more fully, more clearly through the engagement. And it's not just Christianity and Buddhism, but all traditions that can shape and enrich each other in that way.